time I ever sing that. It's uh, 644. We'll sing that more often. 644, the springs of living water. I thirsted in the barren land of sin and shame, and nothing satisfying there I found. But to the blessed cross of Christ one day I came, where springs of living water did abound. The drinking at the springs of living water, happy now am I, my soul is satisfied. Drinking at the springs of living water, oh, wonderful and bountiful supply. How sweet the living water from the hills of God, it makes me happy all the way. Some for it mark the path I've trod, I'm shouting hallelujah. So they satisfy, drinking at the springs of living water, oh, wonderful and bountiful supply. Oh, sinner, won't you come today to Calvary? A fountain there is flowing deep and wide. The Savior now invites you to the water free. With thirsting spirits can be satisfied. Drinking at the springs of living water. Happy now am I, my soul is satisfied. Drinking at the springs of living water. Oh, wonderful and bountiful supply. Amen. And let's do a 440, my Savior, first of all. Four four zero. When my life work descended and I crossed the swelling tide, when the bright and glorious morning I shall see. 
I shall know my Redeemer when I reach the other side, and His smile will be the first to welcome me. I shall know Him, I shall know Him, and redeemed by His side I shall stand. I shall know Him, I shall know Him, by the prince of the nails in His hand. Oh, the soul-thrilling rapture when I feel His blessed of his kindly beaming eye. How my full heart will praise him for the mercy, love, and grace that prepared for me a mansion in the sky. I shall know him, I shall know him, and redeem by his side I shall stand. I shall know Savior, first of all, I shall know Him, I shall know Him, and redeem by His side I shall stand. I shall know Him, I shall know Him, by the prince of the nails in His hand. Fairest Lord Jesus. 48.
personal savior. Good evening. It's good to see everybody tonight. Uh, man, we had quite a few visitors, and I realize some of them were from the church at Kindersley, and some of them were from uh, Brother Bishops, and yet we had um, some other visitors. Did anybody happen to um, uh, meet or talk to that, that middle-aged couple that was sitting right there at the back? If you did... If you did, I'd like to just chat with you after the service. I didn't get a chance to greet them. And uh, so it was a blessing to have them. Um, also, um, Brother Bishop's um, October meeting starts next Sunday. So it runs Sunday through Thursday, October 20th through the 24th. And, of course, that's in Lethbridge. It's about five hours south of here. And, you know, through the years, we've had a few of our folks uh, drive down for a night or two or three of that meeting, if you are planning on going down, um, their church secretary contacted me. Um, I, I got an email yesterday morning, and um, Sister Heather said, if you're planning on going down, please let me know, and then I will let them know, especially if you need a place to stay, and uh, that way all that can be arranged. So if you're, if you're thinking about going down there, um, even if you're just... Seriously considering it, please let me know. Um, I got a neat um, text the other day. Uh, it was a week or so ago. And I've been meaning to share it with you folks. It's from Cody Crevar. Cody Crevar was, uh, he is the missionary going to Ottawa. He's raising support. He was with us on a Wednesday night. Oh, I don't know. I want to say two months ago. And, um, and he said, good morning, Pastor Newman. Just wanted to thank you for the love offering. Also, just thought I'd let you know that your church was the most friendly church we have ever been to thus far on our deputation journey. That goes for both Canada and the U.S., my wife and I were at a church service the other night. And, you know, I mean, hey, I'm sure there's, you know, there's times where we probably had a visitor and they slipped through the cracks. And, you know, that's just the way it works. But my wife and I were at a church service the other night. And, um, you know, I think, I think one person came up and talked to us. Um, and um, that was before and after the service. It was... It was um, really just a living illustration of this very thing. And so God bless you guys, and please keep it up. Amen. You guys are doing a great job. A um, couple things to keep in prayer. Um, Robert's Uncle Jerry, we mentioned that this morning. Stage four lung cancer, surgery, October 21st, and he is lost. So pray for him. Also, I got a text from um, Doug. Doug is the guy that wears the prosthesis that has come. He hasn't been here for a couple weeks, but usually he sits there in the back. And um, he texted me and said, uh, you know, as many of you know, he was showing everybody his new prosthesis. He was really happy about that. And, um, but an infection developed. And, uh, and he has been off work for a while now, and um, it, you could tell by the tone of his text, he was distressed. He's really concerned. So uh, let's remember to pray for Doug as well. Um, if you haven't turned your phones off, if you could help us with that, that would be great. 
And um, let's turn to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the songs we have sung, Lord, and just the blessing of being here again tonight. Thank you, Lord, for the, um, for the, the great crowd we had this morning, the visitors that were here. And, um, Lord, we pray that all of them, both the believers and those that we really don't know, Lord, we, we pray that they were blessed and helped and helped. Um, uh, God, by something that was said, we pray, O oh Lord, that your presence would go with them. And uh, Lord, you continue to speak to them. And um, Lord, we, um, we pray for uh, um, uh, Robert's uh, guy there, uh, Lord, his uncle Jerry. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name that you would please help him. And Lord, we pray most of all that he would be open to the gospel. And, Lord, that he might embrace it and be converted unto thee. And, God, we also pray that you would raise him up. And, Lord, we pray for Doug. Um, Lord, uh, we pray that you would help him also. Uh, God, that he might see thy hand. And, God, that he also would uh, be drawn to thee. And, uh, God, we pray now that you'd bless as we look at your book. And, Lord, help us. Lord, help us greatly, eternally. In Jesus' name, amen. James chapter 1. And um, let's look at verse 26 and 27. James 1, 26 and 27. It says, if any man among you... Okay, so this, this is written to the lost world. It's written to the believers. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue... But deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. You know, there is the word religion, of course, we, um, we usually use it to uh, just to refer to uh, the world and their... Um, their, you know, attempt to be zealous for God in some way, and, and usually it's outside the Scriptures, and it's, it's really just uh, something of a man's invention. That's usually the way we use it. Um, but the Bible refers to religion and, uh, in, in this passage in, um, in two ways. It says that for us there is such a thing as pure religion, but there also is vain religion. I'm going to talk about that tonight. Um, it says in verse 26, If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. The dead giveaway is he bridleth not his tongue. David said in Psalm 39 verse 1, I will keep my tongue with a bridle while the wicked is before me. A bridle is that thing which, you know, you find on a horse. And that is the thing which controls that horse. It steers it. It holds it back. And the rider is in control. And the, the bridle includes the bits and the reins. Um, the bridle is something that holds back. It steers. It controls. Um, look at James chapter 3. James chapter 3, verse 8. James chapter 3, verse 8. It says, But the tongue can no man tame, it is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. You know, it's interesting. The word poison only occurs in the Scripture eight times. And most of the time, it refers to some animal that has venom in its mouth. And, um, and there's only twice that it shows up in the New Testament. And both times, it's in relation to the tongue. And it says, the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly 
poison. The tongue cannot be tamed. The tongue never becomes safe or trustworthy. You can never totally relax when it comes to your tongue. We will never say, my tongue was a problem five years ago, but I got complete victory and I've never had a problem since. <laughs> you know, uh, you will never say that. You, you may say that about some things, but you will never say that on this side of eternity about your tongue. The tongue cannot be tamed, but it can be bridled. Now, this book, the book of James, is written to God's good people. And it has a definite uh, last days thought running all through the book. Uh, four times in James chapter 5, it refers to the last days. And uh, boy, one of the things that he highlights is this thing about the tongue. Um, James is, is a very practical book. Uh, one of the most practical as far as um, there's not a lot of deep doctrinal stuff in the book of James. It's very much about behavior. And um, uh, he has a lot to say about the tongue. Look at James chapter 1, verse 19. James chapter 1, verse 19. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak. Of course, in verse 26, you have our text. All of chapter 3 is about the tongue. Chapter 4, verse 11, it says, Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. Um, he has a lot to say about the tongue. The tongue is to be bridled. It is to be restrained. It is to be curbed. It is to be controlled. And, and we mentioned the word this morning, but... We must be very intentional. You know, it's not going to happen by accident. You know, um, uh, you are going to have to do it on purpose. And the mark of vain religion is they seem. Boy, what an interesting phrase. Look at it in verse 26. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, the mark of vain religion, the verse ends, this man's religion is vain. It means it's, it's empty. It, it carries no weight. Um, the mark of vain religion is they seem to be religious, but there's no controlling their tongue. Look at Psalm chapter 12. Keep your place in James. Look at Psalm chapter 12. Psalm chapter 12, verse 1. David prays and he says, Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth. In other words, he's, he's disappearing. For the faithful fail from among the children of men. They speak. They speak vanity, everyone with his neighbor. With flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things who have said, with our tongue will we prevail. Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? Our lips are our own. But you know, for, for a believer, that's not true. Ye are not your own. Ye are, ye are bought with the price. Look at Psalm 101. Psalm 101. Psalm 101, verse 1. It says, I will sing of mercy and judgment unto thee, O Lord, will I sing. I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when wilt thou come unto me? Notice, 
I will walk within my house. And boy, isn't that where the challenge is? You know, so many people can really, um, you know, control themselves publicly. But the challenge is in that place where you just feel free just to let your hair down. He says, I will walk, verse 2, within my house with a perfect heart. Man, if you can, if you can do good in your house, you can do good anywhere. Amen. Verse 5. Whoso privily, that means privately, slandereth his neighbor, him will I cut off. Him that hath a high look and a proud heart will not I suffer. Verse 7. He that worketh deceit shall not dwell within my house. He that telleth lies. That's something you do with your lips. He that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. You know one thing you don't want to do? You know what we do, don't we? We, we want to keep a, a good testimony and we want to be thought well of. And, um, and you know, that's, that's as it should be. Um, but you know what you don't want to be? Is you don't want to seem to be religious and not be. Some people seem religious, but there's no controlling their tongue. This is the dead giveaway. And there, there's a few in the Bible. And it, boy, isn't it amazing? We, we've mentioned 1 John. We mentioned even recently about how first the book of 1 John is so terribly polar opposites, black and white. And man, you're either righteous or you're unrighteous, you know, and you're just... You're either walking with God or you're, 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 it's, you're on the other end. And, and that's the way 1 John is written. And um, there are so many things that the Lord gives us that are indicators of where we are. The dead giveaway of vain religion is there's no controlling their tongue. Their religion is vain. The word vain means empty. The, the old dictionary, it means empty. It means worthless. It means having no substance or value. And the old dictionary has a whole list under the word vain. And you got to remember the old, the old Webster's Dictionary was written in 1828. And uh, Noah Webster was a believer. And, um, and you, you look at definition number eight and he quotes or he cites James chapter 1. And he says the meaning of the word vain in James chapter 1 is false. This man's religion is vain. It's false. It is deceitful. It is not genuine. This man's religion is vain. Vain religion. Now, there is a, an important distinction that we need to make here, and that is it does not say that there is never a failure with your tongue. Um, I think we would all agree that there are numerous times, and no matter how good you're doing right now, there's just numerous times where, um, and it doesn't mean you're cursing and swearing and screaming, but boy, every once in a while you walk away from a conversation and you think, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have let that cat out of the bag. Um, I shouldn't have commented on that. I shouldn't have elaborated on that. You know, it, it's just, you know, that's why we will never have this rascal licked until we are in eternity. But it does not say that there is never a failure here. It says the problem is when there is no bridle. He bridleth not his tongue. There is no restraint mechanism. There is no desire. There is no urgency. And there is no inborn constraint of the Spirit of God to guard their words. They seem to have control at certain times and in certain places. At church services around certain church people. You guys have heard me tell this story before, but it really illustrates the point. You know, you, you can control your actions, but you can't control your reactions. Um, and uh, there was a church down south, and they were having a prayer meeting, 
And um, in some of those churches down south, and I remember being in one or two of these places, on a Wednesday night, they'd have their prayer time. They give out the prayer requests. Everybody comes to the front. I mean, a bunch of people. They'll, they'll all come to the front. The pastor will say, let's pray. And man, just two-thirds of the audience comes to the front, and they're all praying out loud at the same time. It, you know, just you hear this, this roar of voices. And um, there was this guy here, and he was, you know, one of the, the main guys of the church, and he's just praying away. And, um, and there was a lady beside him, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not being um, unkind here. I'm just stating fact. The gal beside him, she was quite large. And um, she, in the middle of the prayer time, she went to shift her weight. When she did, she lost her balance, and she landed on his ankle. This is prayer meeting. He goes from, and Lord, we just pray that you'd be with so and so. Oh, you blankety blank, 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 blank. You know what that was? That's an illustration of vain religion. There was no bridle. You know what came out? What, came, what would always come out outside of church, but it had never come out in church before because he was careful to not let that cat out of the bag. But when he could be himself and he wasn't worried about God and he wasn't worried about church people, the real monster emerged. No bridle. No bridle. They seem to have control at certain times. But when those certain places and people are not in the picture, they feel free to cut loose with their tongue whenever they think they have a good reason or when someone has aggravated them. By the way, that's called hypocrisy. When they don't have to pretend, when they don't have to guard their behavior, suddenly there's no bridle. There was a missionary with uh, Northern Canada Evangelical Mission, and uh, there's a book about his life. And um, in his growing up years, um, their family would attend church periodically. They had, they had a large family, you know, and this was in the day when it was very common to have eight or 10 or 12 children. And this was one of those families. But back in those days, you know, everybody had those kind of families. And, um, and so... Um, uh, you know, in some of those towns, they, they didn't always have a regular preacher that would be there all the time. So the preacher would come through every once in a while, and, um, and they would have the preacher over to visit. Now, what you have to remember about this guy as he told his family story, he said, he said my dad was just one of the most foul-mouthed people on the planet. And, um, but back in those days, you have to remember something about those days. Um, back in those days, you, you go back into the 30s and the 40s and the 50s, um, you know, it was, it was socially the thing to do to go to church. I mean, most people went to church and, you know, they might only go Sunday morning, and, but they would make their appearance. That was just socially, that was, just, that was the norm. It's not the norm today, but it was the norm back then. And he said... Um, he said, you know, my, my dad would always uh, invite the, the preacher over on whenever he was in town. And, um, and uh, my dad would threaten us. He said he was, very, he was actually quite violent. And, um, um, but um, every, he said everybody at church just thought he was the cat's meow. They just thought he was a great Christian man. And, um, and so every time the preacher was going to come over, he would threaten everybody in the family within an inch of their life. But, but it wasn't like today. Oh, it's like I, I don't want to get started. But nowadays, parents threaten their kids and it means nothing. And that's because there's nothing to the threat. But there was a generation when your dad looked at you and he said, don't you dare. And like, you were like, yes, sir. You know, and you just you just snapped to it. That's the way it used to be. And so this was in those days. And he said, um, you know, this went on for a long time. He said, the preacher just thought my dad was a great guy. He said, everybody at church thought my dad was a great guy. He said, but, but, but we, knew, we knew better. And he said, uh, the preacher came over one day 
And he got poking at the, my little sister. And he said she was quite a pistol in her own right. And he said he got teasing her and teasing her and teasing her. But he was one of those guys that when he teased, he didn't know when to stop. And finally, the little girl got mad and she let loose with a bunch of foul language. Yeah, blankety, blank, 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 blank. <laughs> and uh, the preacher looked at her and said, where did you learn that? She goes, from my dad. <laughs> Society has a term, and the term is called verbal abuse. It's not a new thing. It's been around a long time. But, you know, nowadays society has a name for everything. And some folks in our churches have this down to a science. But they seem to be religious. They seem to love the Lord. They seem to reverence the Bible. But in their private world, they are mean and cutting and degrading and rude and hurtful. And I mean, it's, it's towards their husbands. It's toward their wives. It's towards their children. It's toward their parents. It's toward strangers. It's just all over the place. You know, in Proverbs 31, and, and this, is, this is everybody, okay? This is everybody. But in Proverbs 31, um, you know, the, the Lord doesn't have a double standard, one for men and one for women. He doesn't have a double standard. Um, and, and be ye kind, one to another, tenderhearted, forgive. That's, that's for everybody, isn't it? Ephesians 5, it's just, just for everybody. And we could give you a whole bunch more verses just like it. And, and I don't even need to. You guys know that's the duty of every Christian. You know, um, in Proverbs 31, it talks about that virtuous woman. And it says, and in her tongue is occasional kindness. Do you guys remember that verse? <laughs> Somebody tell me how that verse goes. Nice and loud. The law of kindness. The law of kindness. And in her tongue are veiled threats with ominous silence. Or quiet tones of veiled threats. It doesn't always have to be loud, does it? She seems quiet and smiley, but she carries a big stick. <laughs> Years ago, I remember in the church we attended, and uh, it was just like ours, had a lot of young families in it. And, um, and uh, you know, we would, we would go door knocking. And I remember being out with one of the guys. I was about 25, and he was about, he's about 35. And um, this... He met this couple, and they, they came, they visited the church, and it was one of these kind of couples, you know, the guy, the guy, he seemed like, he was six foot seven, he probably wasn't, but he seemed like, and his wife seemed like she was four foot two, you know, it was one of these kind of couples, and uh, they were coming to church, and he seemed like a real man's man, and she was, um, she was polite, but she was very quiet, and um, I was 25 years old, I was very ignorant of these things. And um, I'll never forget the, the guy that I went visiting with that, that particular evening. Um, we, uh, I, I was with him every once in a while and visiting, and he got talking about that couple. And he said, you know, he said, I visited them, and he said, I had a great conversation with them. But he said, I just sense, he said, I just sense that behind his big, strong male body is a little four-foot-two thing that is... The big stick. And sure enough, it proved to be true. Inner tongue is the law of kindness. The law of kindness. Did you ever think about a, what a law is? The law of gravity. You know, there's, there's never a vacation from the law of gravity. There's never a safe time to jump out of air. There's never a week that's designated no gravity week. And, you know, that particular week, we can jump off the buildings. We can just do anything we want. Why is that? It's, it's because it's a law. A law is something that is, it never takes a vacation. That's, that's why it's a law. There are laws of physics. It's like the laws of God. Do the laws of God ever, does God ever give you a week and say, okay, this week, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn my head and you can have a free for all. You get a free week. He never does that, does he? Law indicates 
a perpetual, never-ending rule, a never-ending barrier or boundary. Inner tongue is the law of kindness. They seem to be religious, but in their private world. They use their tongue to beat others for their failures or mistakes. They use foul language whenever it suits them. They beat people in, in their home with their tongue. They vent their anger and frustration. And when they do, they usually go on and on and on. And they think they are right. Why, why do they do it? Why Do they wake up and go, bless God, this is my day to be evil. <laughs> and I'm going to enjoy it to the max. Is that what they think? No. When they do it, they think they're justified. They think they're justified. They think they're right. They see no reason to hold back and they see no reason to change. There's no bridle. Why is there no bridle? Because their religion is vain. It is one of the foolproof marks of the believer. Is he or she bridles their tongue they want to control it. Will we ever have it down perfectly? Will we ever come to the point that we never make a mistake? I wish I could say yes, but I don't think that day will ever happen on this side of eternity. But the true believer, he wants to control it. He sees the need. He grieves when he fails to control it. They know what is acceptable and what is not. Proverbs 10. The lips of the righteous. No! No! They don't need a book. They don't need a seminar. They don't need to be coached. The lips of the righteous know what is acceptable. How many people have testified? How many people do you know? They got saved. And how many times have we heard it? Somebody said, I got saved. And overnight, I lost half my vocabulary. And you guys know what that's all about. Would you read that verse with me again, James 1, James 1, James 1. James 1, verse 26. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart. They, they really think they're okay. And why is that? They, they, they can't see it. But deceiveth his own heart. This man's religion is vain. It is the dead giveaway. But that person doesn't see it. You know why he wrote this? He wrote this for the observer. The fellow Christian the church member and they, you know, the family member and they see the contradiction. They see the contradiction. Hey, listen, guys, ladies, you know, don't, don't, we, don't we know what it is to, you know, if we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. You might not be living that right this moment, but you certainly understand it. You certainly understand it. And you know, people understand, even lost people understand. Lost people understand. But how much more, how much more do the people close to us, they understand? Well, you know, they... They're part of that church and, and you know, and, and they, they say they believe this. They say they believe this and they say they believe this and they say they want to be like Christ and they say they want to serve the Lord. And yet they see this glaring contradiction. And they don't know what to make of it. They only know this shouldn't be. That's all they know. Verse 26, if any man among you, 
They seem like part of the bunch. But what they have and what the true believer ought to be are not the same. Now, in verse 27, he contrasts that, okay? Verse 27, he says, Pure religion, an undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. The contrast. The contrast is this, this person that's caring to visit the fatherless and the afflicted in their affliction and the widows. It's caring, it's compassionate, it's seeing need, it's gentle, it's time given. Now I'm going to ask you a question, ready? Oh, everybody keep your ears on. They're caring, they're compassionate, they're gentle. Pure religion shows this time given, this care about others. And of course, if you're doing this abroad and not at home, what is that called? Help me out. Hypocrisy. Jesus said to the Pharisees, Woe unto you hypocrites, for ye outwardly appear righteous. Let's look at the Lord for just a moment. It's always good to look at Him. Luke 4. If you look at yourself, you get discouraged. If you look around, you can get discouraged. But when you look at Him, Amen. you see the example. You, you may not agree with somebody and what they say, but you can't help but what you, when you look at Him, you see something. And you go, wow, you know, I'm saved. He's in me. Christ in you. The hope of glory. He's in you. He's in you. He's in you. Luke 4. Verse, uh, Robert and I were talking about this verse this morning. Uh, look at, let's start at verse 16, Luke 4, verse 16. And he, that's the Lord Jesus, came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place wherein it was written. It's, he's quoting Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it again to the minister and sat down. Boy, there must have been a pregnant pause. Because all of a sudden in verse 20, and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. It's the creator of the world. This is the word incarnate. And he has just spoken the word. But I bet it would be something to hear him read it. It wasn't like anybody else. Verse 21. And he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Verse 22. And all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? You know, our Lord began to speak that day and, uh, and, um, and they wondered at the gracious words. You know, the, the wisest man that ever lived said in Ecclesiastes, outside of the Lord, Solomon, in Ecclesiastes 10, verse 12, here's what he said. The words of a wise man's mouth are gracious. Gracious means you're given the benefit of the doubt. You're just, you're, you're kind. You're, you're over the top kind. You're unnecessarily kind. It's an undeserving kindness. The words of a wise man's mouth are gracious. But the lips of a fool swallow up himself. And um, the Lord Jesus Christ is called the wisdom of God. The words of a wise man's mouth are gracious. 
They wondered at the gracious words. He watched his words. He weighed his words. He guarded his words, even in some of the most horrifying, weird circumstances. And of course, we all know, and, uh, and, and you, know, you know, we understand, um, you know, when our Lord dealt with the Pharisees, he knew their hearts, he knew their facade, and the Lord never had any patience for their facade and their taking advantage. And, you know, so he, um, he, he got pretty, pretty vicious with them. But you remember the night that Judas came to betray him? Judas came up. And you know they have that Middle Eastern, I'm not going to kiss you, Robert. <laughs> but you know, they, you know that Middle Eastern custom? I've been in those churches over in Montreal and, and you see those people from those other cultures and they, they hug each other and it's on either cheek. And um, I've had some of them do that to me. It feels a little weird. <laughs> but it's like, I understand and Judas came up and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. What would you have whispered in Judas's ear? I'm not going to kiss you, Robert. Jesus is right there. You know what you said? You said, you're going to rot in hell. That's what you'd have told him. I don't know. That's probably what I would have told him. You dirty snake. But what did Jesus say? He said, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Jesus knew the answer to that question. This dude is going to get him nailed to a cross in the next several hours. And Jesus said, friend, makes you wonder, makes you wonder, makes you, makes you full of wonder about his gracious words. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. Look at Luke 23. You're in Luke. Luke 23. This, you, you're a Christian. You're a believer. He is your master. He is your example. He is your savior. He is your God. Are you, are you, you, I would ask you tonight, and I don't, I'm not trying to be harsh. I'm not trying to do that. But you know what? We, we all want to think, we all want to think we're living for Jesus. Well, you know what? I, I think we're trying. I think we're trying. But the Lord Jesus said, you better snap a bridle on this thing for the rest of your life. Or it will cancel out every bit of your service. This man's religion is vain. It's worthless. All is lost. All the service is lost. You know what the Lord said? He said, look not that ye lose those things which you have wrought. Well, how are you going to do that? Well, I'm going to go commit adultery, and that's how I'll lose it all. No, you, you, there's another way you can lose it. You can lose it right here. You can just lose it right there. That's, that's all it takes. Thank God it's not a matter of, there again, it's, it's not that we never fail. And we'll be, we'll be fighting this battle till the day we go home. But every true believer wants to please his Lord even here. Amen. And he's got a bridle. Man, sometimes that horse gets out of control. But the Holy Ghost yanks his chain and he pulls the bridle. He says, no, I can't say that. No, I can't do this. That's the mark of real, true religion. You, you, you went too far? Then the tongue says, this is when you submit it to the, your gracious master. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. Luke 23 Luke 23, verse 8. 
And when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad, for he was desirous to see him of a long season, because he heard many things of him, and he hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. Then he questioned him in many words. Now here is the Lord sitting there. But he answered him nothing. He kept his words with a bridle. David, full of the Spirit of the Lord, says, I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. You know, our Lord was and is full of compassion. I, there's, there's some verses that bring me great comfort. And this is one of them. You know, he's not just a little compassion. There are some people that they have, most people, most people have a little compassion. But you know, that, that, that can run out pretty quick. But I, one thing I love about the Lord Jesus, it's full of compassion. He is full. And you know, when He is full, it's, it's, not, like, it's not like He's ever going to run out. He is full of compassion toward the sick and the poor and the outcast and the stranger and the fallen and children and the devil possessed and the widow of Nain. He's full of compassion. You say, man, I'm... Say, I'm not doing too good. You know what? You know, you know what he feels when he looks at you today? Praise the Lord. Aren't you glad he's not like some of your relatives? We'd be in a bad way right now. You know what he is? He's, full, you know, he, he, he's not okay with your sin. He's not okay with my sin. But he's full of compassion. He has a longing towards you. Your sin makes him sorry, but his love makes him draw you and want to help you. He's full. Looking unto Jesus, we are not sinless. We're trying to be. We are pursuing and if you're truly His, there's a bridle. This is pure religion. Let's pray. What a Savior. He loves us even with our big mouth. Even after all the terrible things we've said. And you know, some of us have said some terrible things about Him and to Him. And you know what? What a thing. He still loves us.
Father, thank you for your book, and thank you again, Lord, just for simple truth to help us on our way. God, may we glorify you, Lord, in our body, in our spirit, Lord, and in our tongue. And God, we ask it in Jesus' holy name. Amen. God bless you guys, and again, I hope you have a great Thanksgiving.